Why did you want to be an astronaut? You know, I'm asked that often. And uh, for me, it was not a dream that I had as a little kid. In fact, I never even thought about that it was something that I could possibly do. I knew about the space program, but I was more interested in playing basketball and doing other things. Um, I always tried to do my best in school, um, but it wasn't until I became a naval officer and I learned about Bill Shepard, who had a background similar, who my background was sort of lining up with without any special planning. It just sort of was tracking how his career path prior to getting to NASA um, played out. So one day I actually met him or called him and uh, we had a, he gave me some great information and I thought, you know what, that sounds really a, like a really fun job. I think I'd like to do that. So I was probably 26 or 27 when the first and the idea first popped into my head and, and I got the paperwork and applied for, for a, um, a position here. I, I applied in for the what would have been the 2000 class and was not accepted and then applied again um, uh, in 2004 when I was lucky enough to get picked. And ir ironically, there's an astronaut selection going on right now. And when I'm in space, there'll be, uh, the new astronauts will, will be told who they are and they'll be, they'll be called and said, hey, congratulations. And I very much remember that phone call, that very same phone call. So it's an exciting period in those people's lives. So it'll be neat for, I think I was, Mike Full was in space when I became an astronaut, and I remember thinking, wow, holy cow, I'm going to meet that guy here in a few months when he returns. So it's really kind of interesting to be on the other side of it. Tell me about the phone call. Tell me about the, the event of, of finding out you had been selected. So that was interesting because um, I interviewed in, in September, my interview week here in Johnson Space Center. And then I, the next week, literally, I went away on a six-month deployment uh, with the Navy and sort of nothing, no news because I was busy doing my job and, and really the astronaut office was interviewing other groups of, of folks and at one point um, uh, my neighbor came up to my wife, I was gone, you know, and she's an elderly woman and she said, you know, some people from the FBI were asking about Chris's background and my wife said, oh really? And that's the first time we got any indication, this was maybe close to Christmas or something, that, that um, things were trending towards the positive side. And then uh, at the tail end of my Navy deployment, this was in April um, now, so fast forward six months, I got an email message from the selection office that said, please call us Monday at noon or something along those lines. Well, it just happened to be that I was returning home from my six-month deployment that weekend. so. I was home. I was a nice reunion with my family on the weekend, and now Monday arrives, and I wasn't at work because I had the day off. And, and uh, I remember looking at my watch, and if you remember the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, I think it was, or, or maybe, or maybe it was a different movie. But anyways, the clock goes is starting ticking backwards when they're <laughs> when they're waiting for the time to elapse. That's what it was like, and uh, and the phone rings in my house right about five minutes before I was about to call. And uh, I remember perfectly, uh, Kent Rominger was the chief of the office at the time, and he said, hello, is Chris there? Yes, speaking. This is Kent Rominger from, from NASA, just calling to see if you're still interested in working for us. And, uh, and my wife and three kids were in the kitchen. My kids were younger. I don't think they quite realized. My oldest daughter was in fifth grade at the time, and I don't think she quite realized I mean, she kind of got it, but the other two didn't quite. But they just knew that Dad and Mom were really excited, and, and they should be excited, too. And uh, so that was the phone call. You know, I think I said, okay, yeah, yeah, what do I need to do? And he said, oh, I'll make some other, call this other people. They'll tell you when to be here and all those things. And it was a blur after that because a month later we had sold our house and we were on our way to Houston. So very exciting day, yeah. I want to get you to tell me about the Chris Cassidy story from further back than that. Um, go back, tell me about your hometown. Tell me what it was like for you growing up in a small town in Maine. Yeah, southern Maine, York, Maine. It's just over the border from New Hampshire, not maybe an hour, an hour and a half from Boston, hour, hour and a half. So, um, uh, But just a really neat place to grow up. It's on, on the coast of Maine, and 
in the winter time the population is not that big but it almost doubles in I don't know exactly the numbers but it grows quite a bit when in the summer when vacationers come and and uh, and sort of populate the seacoast there so um, I was just like every other boy I mowed, mowed lawns had a couple odd jobs in restaurants and things in the summertime but that was all uh, to really pay my gas to drive to the basketball court and I lived on the we had a basketball court right on the beach and and I remember playing I played would play there all summer long and in, in the uh, um, school year just doing just like everybody else doing my studies I, and, and playing some sports um, and they have a uh, there's a Nubble the Nubble Lighthouse is is in my hometown in York and they have a road race in the uh, in the in Fourth of July weekend called the Four on the Fourth, four miles on the Fourth of July, and it's not a big road race, but it's very popular in the town. And so I'll be hopefully participating in uh, from space uh, as the town runs the Four on the Fourth. I'll be running uh, simultaneously on the space station. Did you just could you see York, Maine from space? I tried. You know, you you kind of okay. There's Cape Cod, and you kind of go up a little bit north, and um, it was. It was difficult to tell with my naked eye exactly which of those coastal inlets was was my town, but with the aid of a uh, of a computer program that ha has a map, it's a little bit easier, and I was able to then pinpoint some of the the time. But again, on the shuttle, it's so busy that opportunity was only one time that I looked and there wasn't clouds, uh, and was able to see. Now, on this going up for six months, I'll have plenty of opportunity to to see that. Uh, tell us more about what happened after you, you finished high school in Maine. From there on into, uh, into college and in your professional career in the Navy, uh, what were the other big milestones for you as you, you worked your way up to ultimately be an astronaut? Right. So after high school, um, I applied to the Naval Academy, but uh, I didn't get accepted right away from out of, out of high school. I was um, given the opportunity to go to the Naval Academy Prep School, which is a one-year program in Newport, Rhode Island. And at the time, I felt a little disappointed that I didn't get directly in, but turns out that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I, I went for my one year at Navy Prep um, and matured tremendously from an 18-year-old guy that really didn't quite, I mean, I was a good kid, but, you know, in terms of life, I was rather immature. And then with one extra year of meeting all these people from around the country and a, and a sort of boot camp environment under our, under our belts, really understood the importance of, okay, I need to buckle down and I'm going to the Naval Academy and this is an important step in my life and uh, let's get it done. And so from there, I went to the Naval Academy and moved on through the four years there. And I was sort of naive when I left high school and didn't know, I just thought I'm going to go be in the Navy. I didn't know that there's lots of different things you can do. You can fly, be on ships or submarines or in the SEAL teams. And uh, once I was at the Naval Academy, I learned about the SEAL program and it really excited me to think, wow, is that something I can do? Do I have it in me to get through that training? Um, and I met some other SEALs and I had some buddies that were interested in as well. So I pursued all the prere prerequisites to get there and fortunately uh, was one of the uh, given one of the positions or billets we called them uh, to attend SEAL training. My wife and I got married uh, right after graduated college and moved across the country to to San Diego, which is where SEAL training is. And uh, and then that was just a really fun time in my life. It was challenging. SEAL training is everything that you see in in the books and the movies. It's a hard program to get through, but very rewarding. And you, I tell people you can't get through it by yourself. Um, it takes a class, you know, you, you, as I was talking about earlier in this interview, there's some days when you need help from others and there's other days where you provide that help to them. And that's exactly what happens in SEAL training. Uh, you know, some days are colder than others for you and other days you look over and that person's shaking and you're thinking, I'm, I'm fine. So it's together you make it through. And that's one of the key lessons I got out of my SEAL training is, is really there's no support from, there's no um, substitute for the support and camaraderie that you can get from a group of people that are focused and putting all their effort into accomplishing one thing. Yeah. So I guess that gets me up to finishing SEAL training and then uh, I, my first assignment in the Navy was in uh, Little Creek, Virginia, which is in Norfolk, and I drove underwater submarines, mini-subs, we call them SEAL delivery vehicles or SDVs. 
And that was a tremendously satisfying job because as a brand new young naval officer, it was just once we submerged, it was just me and my dive buddy. And he's one of my great friends to this day, Travis McNeese. He and I, we spend hundreds of hours underwater together and, uh, and solving challenging problems because it never went right when you got underwater. It was always something breaking. There was always some current or some curveball that throws at you, that's thrown at you, and that has helped me tremendously in my life as an astronaut. The lessons I learned underwater in those mini subs, just working with my hands and my head, trying to figure out challenging problems. So I did that for four years, and then went off to grad school at MIT uh, up in Boston, which now I have a daughter who's a freshman in college there. So we've come full full circle, um, and. After my two years in graduate school, moved back to the West Coast where I was at a SEAL Team preparing, uh, SEAL Team 3 preparing for a deployment. Uh, it just so happened that our scheduled deployment was supposed to be in Thanksgiving of 2001. So we were ready to go. We were the, the most ready SEAL platoon for combat when September 11th happened. Just as luck would have it, that's the position I found myself in. And I say luck would have it because as a person in the military, you train for a reason, and that is to go do those jobs. And other people might have a different perspective of why would you feel lucky that you were going to be headed off to combat. But I think I speak for pretty much most uh, military folks is, you know, that's why we're there, to protect and defend our country, and we're happy to go do that job. So we found ourselves in Afghanistan not too long after September 11th. And uh, um, I came home from that. That was an exciting deployment. I, can't, I could talk forever on that or, or not. But uh, I came home from that deployment in 2002 and moved back to Virginia, where I served at a, as a, in a special boat team, which is another type of uh, job that we have in the SEAL teams. And from that tour, um, is where I applied for and was selected as an astronaut. To fly in space is a job that has got some unique risks to it, but since you're doing that job, I assume you think that those rewards are, are worth it, uh, are worth the risks. But I want to know why. What is it that you think that we are getting or learning as a result of flying people in space that makes those rewards worth the risks you take? Right. You know, that's a really interesting question, and it's a tough one to answer um, because there, there is significant risk. So when you strap onto a rocket, I think I heard John Young say one time, if, you, if you're not a little bit nervous on launch day that you don't understand what's happening behind you. And, um, and that's exactly right. He's exactly spot on. But, um, you know, why do we do it? I think that people like to see people doing interesting things. That's why on the Discovery Channel um, it's so popular to watch programs of people climbing Mount Everest or submerging in a, in a two-person submersible and going down to the deepest parts of the ocean. Um, we as a human being, human beings, we like to explore. There's frontiers of knowledge, there's frontiers of physical space that I think we all just feel compelled to go to. And, and each one of those different types of environments, be it space or high mountains or the water, all bring different aspects to what we can learn, what can we can bring back to better life in a small, either a small spectrum of, of, uh, of our lives or a broader, in a broader sense of, uh, of, and that's how I think the space program is. Again, John Young said, and he's always got great quotes, but one of his, my favorite quotes of his is, single planet species don't survive. And, uh, you know, I tend to, again, agree with him. It's, at some point, we're going to have to, and maybe it's not in it, our lifetimes, maybe it's in several generations from now, but there'll be a time when there'll be people living on other planets. And it's the work, the hard work that we're doing right now, all of us across the globe, that are going to set the stage for, for that type of environment, just like Christopher Columbus set sail one day across the ocean. And thanks to those great explorers, we live the life that we do today. 
You and your crewmates are next in line.